Good morning. Happy New Year. This is Pastor Stephen Kaiser of the Memphis Raleigh Seventh Adventist Church. We're glad you're joining us for our presentation this morning, Grace Before Time Began. But before I begin, I want to say thank you to the Raleigh Church, Leslie and I both, for the nice Christmas gift. We appreciated it. Um, very nice. Also wanted to thank those who participated in last Sabbath's Christmas program. I think of Deborah, great organization, getting things ready. It was a great help, did a good job. Pearl and Mike did a good job. Calvin De La Paz, his wife Marie, their sons Matt and Kurt. Calvin's the principal of MJA. His wife is a teacher there, and they had a big part to play. Uh, David singing. We think of those who read scripture, Delphi and Adolphe, Alliance, Bertine, uh, Michu, and also Janice and JD, and I believe also Kurt read a, a scripture too. So thank you for making it special. It was really nice and a, and a blessing. So let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll start our presentation. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you for your great grace and the gospel. And as we start the new year, help us to start off on the right foot, just moving forward in a mighty way and being close to you, knowing that you are close to each one of us. So have your Holy Spirit here with me, those who are watching, in Jesus' name, amen. I want to start off with a scripture from the Apostle Paul. And it said, But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. He wanted to bear witness and testify about the gospel, but there's an aspect here that he wanted to testify about, and it was the grace of God, the love, the mercy, the compassion of God. And we will study this deeper as we move into this sermon. Now, there's a lot of debate over the gospel of grace. For instance, there's dispensationalism. God deals with people different ways and different different uh, dispensations of time. In the Old Testament, they were saved by works or law. In the New Testament, it's by grace. And in the New Testament, there are one, uh, teachings like predestination, that God has chosen some to be saved and some to be lost. And no matter what you do, you can't change either way. There's also once saved, always saved. Once you confess Jesus, you're saved, you have it. And even though you sin in the future, you can't lose it. So works have little significance in the once saved, always saved. And I have had Bible studies with people who believe once saved, always saved. And once we start getting into it, and I start sharing my view, they start sharing their views, finally, two different men, two different studies told me, I could premeditatively murder you, kill you, and not repent, and I would still be in heaven. One of them, his wife was sitting next to him, looked at him, and she said, no. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. I'm glad she said it because I would have. And then we have free choice. And that's what some of the Adventists believe. We believe that God's salvation by grace is open to all, and as to all who believe, all who accept it will be saved. And as we look at grace and salvation, we understand that a man's work shows the condition of his heart. And God judges us according to our works but he also saves us by grace. So as we look at this salvation, grace, gospel, in a basic level, we choose our own destiny. Our choices decide whether we end up in heaven or whether we end up in the lake of fire. So what is grace? That is a, a good question. A great poet can take a worthless sheet of paper, write a poem, and make it worth thousands of dollars. That's genius. Bill Gates can sign his name to a check and give the, De the Detroit school system uh, $2 million. That's called capital. Our government can print bills, put a Ben Franklin on it, and that's money. A carpenter can take material and build a beautiful home, and that's called skill. An artist can take a canvas, paint a beautiful picture on it, 
and make it worth thousands of dollars, that's art. God takes a worthless, sinful life, washes it in the blood of Jesus Christ, puts the Holy Spirit in that person, and makes that person a blessing to humanity. That is called grace. What is grace? Grace is unmerited favor. Grace gives us something we don't deserve. Salvation is a gift of God, free, offered free to all who accept it, if we accept it. How big is God's grace? Is there enough grace? And the gospel, is it enough to cover everyone? Let's go back. Let's go back in time. In the time of Noah before the flood, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, that the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of the heart was only evil continually. So the whole human race basically was just corrupt at that time. Every thought of their heart was greedy, covetousness, angry, hateful, evil, continually. It also says the earth was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Genesis chapter 6, verse 11. So the people were corrupt, violence filled the earth, pain, suffering, maybe wars, people doing mean things to each other. But with all that was going on, every thought of the heart being evil continually, the earth corrupt, filled with violence. Let's go to Genesis here, Genesis chapter 6, verse 8. And it says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So Noah found grace. And Noah found grace because it was not hidden. God's grace is available for everyone and anyone in every generation. Furthermore, we learn about Noah, chapter, Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. This is the ge genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. He was a righteous person, perfect in his generations, honest in all his dealings. He was having an intimate, deep relationship, being in harmony, walking with God. We read in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, By faith Noah. So why did Noah build the ark? By faith Noah being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. So we see that Noah was a, a man who was living righteousness by faith. By faith he moved to build the ark. He was perfect in his generation. He was a noble, righteous man. And that was available to the whole human race, not just Noah. What made the difference? Noah chose. Noah chose to follow God. Peter tells us here, chapter 2, verse 5, in Second Peter, and I'll put God, did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness. He was preaching right doing. He was preaching right living. He was preaching getting right with God, doing what was right and acceptable and honest and lawful. But because the world didn't accept his preaching, God judged the world because of that. They had a witness to get right with him. God didn't send a flood and anger and wrath just with them not even knowing that they could get saved? Of course they could have. And because they rejected Noah's preaching, it says here, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. And we know from Jesus' teaching in Matthew and other places is that Noah, Noah's day, is a, and Noah are a type of what's going to happen at the end of time. So the world will be wicked, but God will have a people who have righteousness by faith at the time of the second coming. Then we go up. We go up to Abraham. And it says here, Galatians chapter 3, 7 and 8, Therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing 
that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. Going all the way back, all the way back to Abraham, God was already laying the foundations that the whole human world, Noah's relatives, Abraham, and then it says here that the Gentiles, those who were not born of their stock, the Gentiles, I'm a Gentile. I go back to France. My, my relatives go all the way back to France, place near Paris, so that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. So God's grace would help people who accept salvation to be in right standing with God, to be justified. That now you're no longer an enemy of God, you're a friend of God, you're a child of God, you have a right robe, God has given you the Holy Spirit, you have a new heart, you're living a new life based on faith of what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary when he's doing the heavenly sanctuary to pour his power on you to keep you saved. So God, all the way back there, had a gospel that the Gentiles would be justified by faith. And it continues on. It said he preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand. Back there, Abraham had the same gospel that Noah had, the same gospel we have. So preach the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. And we know that is because Jesus came out of that, out of that family tree. So God also promised not only a blessing to all nations, but that the descendants of Abraham would be abundant. Well, how abundant? Let's don't guess. Let's let the Bible tell us. Genesis chapter 22, verse 17. Blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven. So everyone who is justified by faith is an heir with Abraham. We are adopted into the family. And it says, it'll be what? Like the stars of the heaven. That night when God took Abraham out and said, count the stars. Well, maybe, I think I read an article one time that back then they had that they could see about 8,000 stars. And they thought how, that's how many stars there were. But with the Hubble, uh, Hubble telescope, now we know there's a lot more than just uh, 8,000 stars. It's just everywhere at points. There's thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of stars. So we can be part of that number. If it's that big, what's keeping us from being a part of a number so large that it's like the stars of heaven? Then he continues on, not only as the stars of heaven, and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gates of their enemies. Have you ever tried to count a bucket of sand? I never have. I probably never will, and neither will you. It's just you can't do it. But this is not just a bucket of sand. It's all the sand on all the seashores and all the world. That's a huge number. And I like this part here, and it says, Your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. God is telling him, Your people win. Your people. When you possess the gates of somebody, you have control. You have defeated them when you get their gates. So we see that we win. And if you want to be on the winning side, then I want to encourage you to give your heart to Jesus. That's how you're on the winning side. He has chosen you. Remember our kids in the playground? Usually the best two players would odds or evens, and then they start choosing sides. And you always wanted to be on the side of the best player because you know your chances of winning were better. Well, we are on the side of the best player. That's Jesus. He doesn't lose. All you, and you need to choose him. He's already chosen you. Anybody who comes, he will no wise cast you out. But you have to accept his invitation. Not hold it off and say, later, no, nah, not now, I'm too busy, I got other things to do, I don't feel like following you, and I have more fun this way, and I think I'm better off. Mm -mm -mm. 
Jesus has called you. Now you need to get out of that group on the playground and walk over to the best player and be part of his team. Continuing here with Abraham, Genesis 28, 14, and also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and the east. I'm going to stop here. Stars of heaven, all the sand and all the seashores, and all the dust of the earth. That's three different ways that God is illustrating his desire to fill his kingdom with people. God is not in the business of keeping out. The gospel and grace is not keeping you out. It's actually the doorway in, and it's abundant. It's abundant. So God is trying to get you in, and he's giving us these pictures that are just so above what we can even think, like sand of the sea, stars of the heavens, dust of the earth. God is saying, I want lots and lots and lots of people living with me for all eternity. God wants you living with him for all eternity. So you shall spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north, and the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Basically, God is saying is, your people are going to just take over this whole planet, north, east, south, west. It's yours. And in your seed, in Jesus Christ, he's the seed. All the families, every family, doesn't matter. Africa, Asia, Europe, America, South America, Australia, all those continents, all the islands. It says all. All colors. All races. Matter of fact, it says every kindred, nation, tongue, and people in the book of Revelation. And Jesus in Matthew 24 says, the gospel of the kingdom will go into all the world to a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. So Jesus is after everyone, and he's after you. And have you been hiding from him? Have you been running from Jesus? You can run, but you can't hide. He will find you. And when we look at this northeast, south, and west scenario, it boils down to the meek will inherit the earth, the converted, the ones whose grace has softened and subdued the evil nature and made us a new person. Hebrews gives us an insight into Abraham here. Hebrews 11, verse 8. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place which he would receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was what? Going. Maybe that's why some don't answer the call, because you're afraid of where God's going to lead you. you got to go. He'll never lead you contrary than is what is best for you. Go. When he calls you, go out. Thinking of changing your life, we'll talk about that a little later. Absolutely. But those changes are for your welfare, for your not only temporal here, on this side of the second coming, but for eternity. God has your best interest at heart. Jesus preached the gospel, Mark chapter 14. Sorry, this should be um, Mark chapter 1, 14 through 16. It says here, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. So now we're getting into this gospel that God is talking about, this gospel that was given before time began. And the way to enter in is repent, believe the gospel, take Jesus as your Savior, and now walk in newness of life. Peter is preaching here, and he picks up on this uh, blessing to Abraham. I just want to show Noah had it, Abraham had it, Israel had it, and uh, Jesus had it. They all had the same gospel. There's only one gospel. Paul says, if you preach another gospel, you are cursed. So we have it. Peter's telling the Hebrews, you are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, 
and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So here's that blessing again that goes back that we read earlier. So what is the blessing God gives to all the families of the earth? Now this is verse 25 of chapter 3. Well, there's no guessing. Peter didn't want them to say, oh, I just wonder what that is. He tells them. He tells them. Next verse. To you first, God raised up his servant Jesus, the seed that would come. Send him to what? Bless you. The blessing of Abraham. But what is the blessing of Abraham? Sent him to bless you in turning, every, turning away every one of you from your iniquities. The blessing of Abraham is the new birth. It's a turning from sin, a supernatural act through the Holy Spirit that makes you a new person, a new mind, a new heart, a new spirit, new goals, thoughts, desires. Everything becomes new, it says in the Bible. So the blessing of God is to turn you from the power of Satan to the kingdom of God, turning you from a sinful life of slavery to, to sin and evil and lust and greed, all these things, to turn you from them. So you're going this way to perdition with all these evil traits. And what does Jesus do? He's turning you, and now you're walking a whole new way. Repentance is a change of mind. It's a change of direction. So turning away, it actually has to turn you from destruction. It's like you're it's just a, a rushing car going down a hill with no brakes. And what does God, Jesus do? He has to turn you so you don't crash. And that's what Jesus wants to do. So that grace of God gives us freedom from sin and Satan. And if you want to be free, give your life to Jesus. Surrender to him. Surrender to him. Now, there is more to the blessing given to Abraham. Acts chapter 5, verse 31. Him, Jesus, God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior. So he's talking to the Hebrews again. To be a prince and a savior. But what's the purpose? What's the purpose of the resurrection? So he's at the right hand of God. Is he just sitting there? Are they just talking and hanging out? No. Him, God has exalted Jesus to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. So it's not just repentance to Israel, it's to give repentance to the whole world and to forgive sin. Ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins on your knees. Confess it to him. Give it to him. And he will give you repentance. You can't be sorry for your sins on your own. Jesus has to give it to you as a gift. Pray for it. And forgiveness of sins is a gift. It's a wonderful gift where you're free of the guilt and penalty. Sure, there may be some things you need to correct, and there may be some penalties here on earth because of things you've done, breaking man's laws and breaking God's law. But even if, you have, if you're in prison, we have... A prison ministry, it's on hold now because of COVID, but those men are sorry. Even though they're still in prison, they know they're forgiven, and they know that they have eternal life. So Jesus is our Prince, our Savior. Help us to have a changed life and to be a living a clean life. This is the text that we get our Sermon title from 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. So God's own purpose. God is purposeful in saving the human race. He had a purpose to redeem the human race according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before time began. I can't understand that. Before time began. Let's think about it. God has lived for all eternity. And before he created time, he has already had grace upon any being 
that he would create. Before the angels were created, we know in Job, the sons of God came to a meeting up in heaven. So there were, there were other um, beings out there. So God, let me read it again, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus, before time began, Time can also be translated as ages, before the ages. So far back before time, God was already a God of grace. Always a God of grace. The Estee Bible Commentary translates that phrase, before time's eternal. That is so far back, there isn't even a number big enough. God was a God of grace. He's always been a God of grace. Satan demonizes God as his mean being, trying to take away your fun and all this. But the truth is, is God has always been kind, loving, patient, forgiving. So even before time began, that's how, that's how much grace and abounding grace we have. When I lived in Seattle, I was uh, working for the Washington Conference. I attended a, a church, a Baptist church, had a training seminar on how to study the Bible. It was precept ministries. And it was a, and it, over the weekend, and I went... And it was pretty good. And they were using the book Second Timothy to uh, show us how to study the Bible. We weren't studying Second Timothy, you know, to find out what his meaning it was. Just you know, how to do cross-referencing, word studies, context, time phrases, all kinds of things like that. And I'm going to go back to this slide. And as he was going down, he came to this verse. And some translations say before world began, or but it's actually before time began or before the ages. That's the, really the most direct. So he was working through, he came to this verse here. Then the speaker stopped. I was sitting maybe three rows back and he went into how God was not surprised by Satan's fall, that he had it all under control, that grace was already there. And I'm looking around and this is a Baptist church and I knew these people were once saved, always saved people. And uh, dispensationalist, and as he was going on, I was thinking, this guy, you think he was a Seventh-day Adventist. It was really insightful on this grace before time began. So as he was winding down, I raised my hand, and he said, oh, you have a question? I said, well, if what you're saying is true, does that mean the human race has always been under grace? And I said, you know what I'm doing? I'm freezing. That's what he did. He just froze. He froze for about, I don't know, six, seven, eight seconds, and from the back, somebody yelled, no, because they understood that their theology is going down, and it should have that day. And I'm so glad to ask that question, because maybe somebody was listening and realizing, you know what? Hmm, maybe I need to take a new look at how I view salvation. So God has always had grace on the human race. There's never been a time when we didn't. Adam and Eve sinned. Who's seeking them out? God. Cain didn't offer the right sacrifice. Who's going after Cain? God. You're running away from God. Who's going after you? God. Why? To turn your life around, to fit you for his kingdom. And he supplies the power. He supplies the forgiveness. Grace. Before time's eternal or before time began. So Noah found grace. Abraham found grace. Jesus was teaching grace in the gospel. The Apostle Paul was teaching it. God gave it to us, and he gave it to us before time began. So we see the world has always been under grace. Never a time when it wasn't. How do we know humanity will always be under grace? Does it, did, did it end at the cross? Will it end at the second coming? Will grace end there? I mean, it was so far back down that way before time began. Before God made time, there was grace. Well, here's another verse, Ephesians chapter 2, and 4 through 8, and I condensed it down here. God made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, the eons, we would call that, indefinite periods of time. In the eons, or ages to come, so in those ages future, 
after the second coming, in the ages to come, he, God, might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So not only do we have grace before time began, grace at creation, Jesus was a lamb slain from the foundation of the world, grace, the promise to Adam, into Noah, Israel, Jesus, New Testament church, and into eternity, and all the ages to come, God will always be exhibiting his grace, the exceeding riches of his grace. I mean, it's abundant. There is so much grace. We're sin abound. Grace abounds all the more. So no matter what you've done, God has the ability to cover that, pay for it, and to cleanse you and give you a new life. It's called the exceeding riches of his grace. It's so much, it's just it's just everywhere. It's just permeating if we would just open our eyes. The Young's Little Translations, Acts chapter 1, verse 16. Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the good news of the, of the Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who is believing both to Jew first and to Greek. So, Paul wasn't afraid of the good news, the gospel of Jesus. It's the power of God for salvation. And it's the gospel of grace is what we're talking about. This power, the power to make you new, the power to make you brave, the power to help you stand firm and resist temptation, the power that once you resist, he gives you the ability to keep resisting. To, not only does he give you a new life, he gives you power to live the new life, to keep it consistent and growing. So God's grace is personal, powerful, strong, mighty, and abundant. God has more than enough grace for you. More than enough grace for you. So why is this important? Because God has always been and will always be fair and just and loving when relating to us. Whether we're lost or whether we are saved, God treats us with truth and grace with kindness, compassion, and respect. God is no respecter of persons. We are all the same before him. We all have the same opportunity to live with him forever. We are all equally important in God's eyes. And that young little translation says that the one who is believing, believing in Jesus has everlasting life. You can be upright. You can be honest. You can be a changed person. God can change you. And then from there, as a newborn baby Christian, he grows you, grows you in grace, grows you in knowledge, grows you into the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ. You're growing. You're growing exceedingly. So I want to ask you today to start a new life. It's January 2nd. Why not start a new life at the beginning of a new year? Make that decision. Make a New Year's resolution that will stick because you're not by yourself to carry it out. Jesus gives you help. He gives you power, guidance, courage, direction. He's with you. Emmanuel, God with us. So I want to ask you, don't let this day go by without getting on your knees somewhere quiet and just devote your life to him. Read your Bible. Pray. At the Raleigh Church, we know because of the lockdown, our church is closed, but we still have prayer meeting on Zoom. Go to the RaleighSDA.org website and download the bulletin. There's a link for Zoom meeting, Zoom prayer meeting. You can get on with your device or you can call in on your phone like it's a conference call. Join us for a prayer meeting. On that link, I can, um, or you can email me. I'll send you a copy of the book. Right now, we're doing Faith and Works by Ellen White. We're going to be starting Chapter 4 coming up uh, this week. Also, we have prayer meeting, Sabbath morning, 9.30 to 10.30, before we have this streaming. Join us then. If you don't have a quarterly, go to... Google Play Store, I'm not sure if Microsoft has it, 
on their store, depending on your device, they probably do. In Google Play Store, type in Sabbath School Quarterly, and it will pop up. Might be a couple will pop up. Choose the one you like the best and join us. Do it during the week. So when you come, you're prepared. You can answer questions, dialogue with other believers, building relationships, getting a, a group of people. The Raleigh Church is a good church. It's one of the friendliest churches I've ever pastored. I've been in the ministry, I think it's the, this is my 27th year. And it's a good church. Places where you can grow, uh, try to have you contribute your spiritual gifts. Join us for Sabbath school. Join us for prayer meeting. If you want Bible studies, either me or one of my elders can give you Bible studies. Either you're going to have to be through Zoom or Instant Messenger or through the phone because of the social distancing. We can send you the lessons. We can download them and, and send them as an email to you. And you can have Bible study. We can pray with you. We can encourage you. So you're not alone. Not only is God with you, Jesus with you, Holy Spirit with you, the angels are with you. God has a church who is for you and with you. And we have resources to help you. So you can have a group of people like-minded like you to encourage you. God wants you to be successful. God wants to pour his grace into your life. God wants to make you a new person. He wants to forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness and help you to be clean. There's nothing like feeling clean if he wants to clean you up by the blood of his son. So today, don't let this day pass. Right now, you can do it now in your heart. You may be in a room with people. Just in your heart, give it to them now. Maybe later in the day, kneel down somewhere and just... Just give it to him. Be in his hands. Say, Lord, I want to be in your hands. He's the part of you're the clay. And anybody in his hands, nothing. No man, I should say, can fuck you out. You can walk away if you want. Jesus doesn't force you to love him. That's another beauty about God's grace. It's free love, choice. God loves us freely, and we get an opportunity. We have a decision to love him. So I just want to let you know God loves you. He cares about you. He wants you in the kingdom. You are special to him. May he be special to you this coming year. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for that abundant grace that was given before time began. Be demonstrated through the ages to come. It's given to us now to make a difference in our lives, to save us, that we may enter into your kingdom and live with you forever. So help us to make the decision to choose you, choose your son, and to know that he who has a son has life. And if there's somebody who was a Christian at one time and maybe uh, you're dragging your feet, maybe you've backslid, that you will make a new decision, a recommitment to God, you and your family, the people you hang out with, all of you together, if you can. If they don't want to join you, you join in by yourself and get right with Jesus. He is calling you. Come unto me, all you labor and heavy laden, I will give you rest. That's what he wants to do, is to give you the rest of soul, peace in your heart that comes from his grace. In Jesus' name, amen.